All right. Well, great to be here with everyone. Um, this week, we are going to get into some of the physicality of the soil. Um, we're going to talk plant taxonomy and anatomy. It's been my experience, the, the more we can understand about the beings that we are working with, um, the greater we can work with them. Um, this is uh, kind of the, the physical component being the plant itself. Uh, we also talk about the physicality of the soil um, in regards to bioenergetic agriculture, uh, the landscape being a physical, mineral, biological, and energetic capacity to a living system. So what I try to do is just flesh out a little bit about each platform. Um, if we're aware of, of the components of a living system, uh, we can be very thorough in how we engage and we can make the system work better for us, for itself, uh, and work with it to get more out of our farms and our gardening. Uh, so, and that can really be applied to just about every aspect of, of agronomy from hydroponic growing to acreage farming to container gardening. Uh, so let's just jump right in. Uh, today, um, you know, again, we're going to talk plant taxonomy and, and anatomy. Um, the tree of life is, is kind of a riddle. Uh, try to define life, right? Um, many people have. So uh, what we may be familiar with from grade school biology class uh, is the kind of the organization of domains, uh, subdomain, sub below that in kingdoms and then phyla. Uh, again, you know, when you're defining life, this is, this is a, a living concept, I would say. Um, pretty much reworked the tree of life uh, collectively maybe a year ago with the discovery of archaea, um, organisms that don't fit nice and neat in the construct that we were using. Uh, it's kind of a trip when we get together and decide that life has changed when it's been the way that it's been long before us. Um, so, you know, you can see the different postures, some of them, uh, as they've kind of been developed and there's a champion of each one and um, a lot of personality involved. If you look into it, it's kind of interesting. Uh, you know, the, the, the five kingdom from the UK was uh, compared to the sixth kingdom that you may remember from textbooks. Uh, that's kind of a US posture. And then in 1990, there was an offering of, of domains, which kind of created a, a larger uh, umbrella for all of life to fit under, um, those being the bacterial, the archaea, and the eukarya. Uh, eukarya is what we're most familiar with um, because we can see them. Archaea are, we're basically outside of the view of humanity until a number of years ago. We just didn't imagine that there were life forms that small. Um, really fascinating story. I'll put a uh, the story of, a, of this farmer in Texas in the show notes, uh, that's just a fascinating read. It's kind of too long to get into here. Um, but um, really amazing, the abilities of archaea. We put that in our uh, microbial inoculant earth compound. Been used to uh, regenerate oil spills, uh, all sorts of, of applications um, for cleaning environments. And they, they eat ions. They don't eat raw organic matter like the soil food web bacteria to uh, fungi protozoa, but they, they kind of uh, calibrate the ionic form so that plants can take it back up. It's kind of the final process of the breaking down process so that it can be built back up. Uh, bacteria, everybody's fairly familiar with. Um, and the eukarya are, again, most of what we're familiar with. They, they encapsulate fungi, plants, animals, and protists. Uh, protists are, are kind of a funny category. They're kind of more of a catch-all, uh, as, as we'll see. Um, but obviously, we're going to be talking about the plant um, kingdom mostly today. But protists are kind of everything that doesn't fit the other three. Um, and then, so, you know, think of the eukarya as uh, having membrane-bound organelles. What that means is there's, there's cells with uh, organs inside of it, like a nucleus or a mitochondria, et cetera. Um, so you can see, trying to, def you know, people have tried to make a flow chart out of life and the tree of life uh, over time and in different fashions. And, you know, you can see you are here and you can get, a, get the gist. Uh, you know, I said it before, but we know 5% of bacteria, 10% of fungi at the rate of discovery. So, you know, trying to take an inventory of life is a never ending process. 
Uh, it's a worthy exercise, uh, but good luck to those that are trying to get to the finish line. Um, so these are almost more beautiful to look at than they are functional. Um, but it gives you an idea of the scope of what we're dealing with, uh, trying to define life. So the, the, the plant kingdom um, is defined by multicellular autotrophic eukaryotes, which conduct photosynthesis. Uh, big words. Basically, autotrophic is being able to make their own food. Um, eukaryotic means uh, they can generate their own food from their environment rather than having to eat other organisms. Um, and then conducting photosynthesis. Uh, that's, you know, we're all generally familiar with the idea that plants make their own food. That's one of the things that makes them so amazing. Uh, and thank goodness for that. Um, so there's over 300,000 species cataloged in, in the uh, plant kingdom. Uh, in some respects, it needs, they, you know, they need no introduction because, you know, we're all aware of plants. Uh, they keep us alive. Um, but to get into some of the structure of this, um, this is a little bit more of a simplified version of the plant kingdom. And it goes, we're going to take a, a little bit of a detailed approach through the history of plant progression over the, over the years. It's really fascinating. Um, and you basically, in a, in a nutshell, come from algae as the simplest organisms up to the um, flowering plants that we see today. Um, so I wanted to show you, I'm a big fan of uh, 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 time uh, lapse photos, sorry. Um, and this video is just pretty amazing. Um, so I'm gonna pull this up for you here. My wife owns a production company and, and uh, I'm trying to get her into uh, there you go into doing some of these for me because they're, they're endlessly fascinating but this is just a particularly good one. Check this out. <laughs> Wow, that's uh, just so uh, remind me, do I need to reshare the screen coming back to this or am I good? No, you're good. You need to go into full screen or whatever. Yeah, gotcha. Okay. Cool. So if that doesn't show you the full cycle of life there, um, in a nutshell, it's pretty amazing. Um, I uh, particularly like the... Uh, when plants grow up like that, you know, it's, it's kind of fascinating to, to ponder, you know, it's one of the things we'll get into in the energetic capacity. You know, a lot of plants grow up against gravity. There's a, a life force involved and seeing plants move really gives you a good appreciation for that. It's not something that we're used to seeing um, without an extreme level of patience. Um, but it's really important to, to understand that plants are sentient beings. They have this ability to react to their environment and to have desires and what they push through their roots as exudates to attract teammates. Um, so they have all of these amazing abilities that many of them are restricted by the way we provide fertility for plants. Plants can make their own antifreezes, their own antibiotics, um, all sorts of different capacities in plants that are restricted based on a complete spectrum of essential and trace elements. Um, 
so you know you'll you'll hear me talk about that over time. I'm a, a big proponent of, of trace elements and and not having to understand the exact pathway of an element to to see its value. Um, so here's some of the the characteristics of, of plants. You know they're eukaryotic. Again, that means that they they have a nucleus and an organ. Uh, something like a bacteria or a K are prokaryotic, meaning they don't uh, they don't have uh, organelles in their cells. They're single celled organisms. Um, Plants have cell walls. Um, they have chlorophyll to photosynthesize. They are autotrophic, uh, as we discussed, which means they can form the materials that they need for the metabolism from the environment um, rather than having to eat other organisms, which would be called a heterotroph. Um, they have an ability to grow by cell division. They're both sexual and asexual, uh, and they have defense mechanisms to pr protect them. Um, Again, many of which are limited by the lack of trace elements in, in the environment. Uh, and they generally lack motility. It means they don't move uh, uh, and to consume their energy. Um, so this is you know, a lot of the reason why in agriculture, which is a manipulative uh, undertaking, we need to take such care to make sure that the ecosystem is complete uh, to the best of our ability. Um, so... I wanted to take one step back from the flow chart we saw a minute ago and just kind of give you a, a quick story of how plants came about. Um, in the beginning, there was algae. Um, so, you know, and you can imagine, you know, that's, that's the, the scenario where, um, you know, you've got no land plants, you've got, um, you know, the ability to, um, that's already, there. You've got the ability of of photosynthetic organisms in the in the ocean, uh, for lack of a better word, you know, would we call it an ocean back then? Um, that move on to land and begin to create the atmosphere through photosynthesis of using carbon dioxide to produce the oxygen. This is an image of a an algae. And I just wanted to show you this because not only is it just fascinating to see the minutia of how life works, but you can really see in this the lack of organelles inside these cellular um, components here. It's, it's simply just a, a cytoplasmic flow, meaning it's, it's just uh, life is encapsulated in a single organism. It's as simple as it gets. Um, so you can kind of take this for granted, seeing seaweeds and these kinds of things, but this is, this is really where life comes from. Um, and then from this process, the photosynthesis begins to happen, builds the environment, and um, we'll talk about the progression through these stages. Plants have come a real long way, not unlike us. Um, so you have, let's see. The algae. Um, you move up into uh, the land plants, which are called bryophytes. Bryophytes are mosses. Um, really no other way to describe it. Very simple organisms. Um, they don't have uh, vascular systems, which means they don't have xylem and phloem to move nutrition um, and metabolites up and down the organism, uh, which means they're not going to grow very tall, right? Because they can't. They don't have the, the, the force of energy to move what the plant needs to live and be a plant uh, up any sort of distance. Um, so they're very primitive, no flowers, no seeds, spores only, it's about 25,000 known species. Um, and again, this is the transition between aquatic plants, say algae, um, to where we are today and flowering plants, angiosperms, uh, liverworts and hornworts are, are also um, in this category, if, you, if you're familiar with those. So you've got these bryophytes moving up and you, you get this branch into what, what are called seedless vascular plants. Um, and these are also called tracheophytes. Um, so you have the vascular seedless plants. This is about, you know, that split was about 425 million years ago. Um, you start to see the ferns. And so we've got an ability to reproduce through spores, uh, just like the bryophytes, but you get a, a little bit more complexity in, in the organism. And then you've got a branch into the gymnosperms, which are non-flowering plants. Uh, they do have a vascular system, 
Um, they have the first seeds in pollen um, in concept. It's about 365 million years ago. So think pine trees and conifers. Um, and then you have a movement into what's called angiosperms, which are the plants we're most familiar with. They're about 80% of the known plants living today. Um, so they've, they've come to dominate the landscape. And they have seeds, uh, flowers, fruit that protects the seed and entices uh, different animals to come eat and distribute. Uh, this is about 130 million years ago. And there was a, uh, everybody knows Charles Darwin. Uh, so Darwin was you know, a, a scholar of all things in the natural world. Um, and he termed the leap from the uh, gymnosperms to the angiosperms, from the conifer, uh, you know, non-flowering plant to the flowering plant. And he studied it intensely and, and he couldn't figure out how it happened. I, I mean, in some respects, how do we? But normally there's a fossil record that kind of shows a bridge in some way. And there was nothing to connect the dots. There was no obvious reason as to why plants went from, you know, this lack of complexity to this increasing complexity. Um, he called it an abominable mystery. Um, so it, it's basically the idea that this leap happened. And scientists don't like leaps. You know, they, they don't like uh, missing pieces in the fossil record. People dedicate their lives trying to build bridges to these lacks of understanding. I'll put this link in the show notes. There's kind of a cool backdrop to this history. Um, but it's, it's really kind of fascinating to carry the thread. And it hit me when I first studied it um, in, in a really interesting way because I always kind of look at, um, I try to draw parallels to how people in different contexts talk to each other and or and don't talk to each other meaning you know like farming uh, farming happened we talked about in previous uh session in 13 different places it was 11 or 13 different places on earth in relatively the same time it was time for humans to start farming and people heeded the call all over the world without talking to each other without passing this information this is how you do it on to the next person they couldn't pick the phone up right um so in some respects, it was it was the same with plants. You know, it was time for plants to in, to take that leap, to, in some ways of looking at it, support the development of the human organism. Um, you'll kind of hear me tread on this uh, over time because you know there's a, there's an an element of like inevitability to how humans come about and evolve. I call it evolution uh, because I think it needs a different term than evolution. Darwin didn't talk about humans and the origin of species. Uh, because they don't fit the mold, right? And Rudolf Steiner gives a very good uh, platform for this understanding that we'll get into in the future in some detail. Um, but the idea is that, you know, you've probably heard the time, time speeding up. Um, you, you may also have heard of Terrence McKenna. He, he is uh, uh, a psychedelic. He's, he's got tremendous insight. Um, not taken as seriously as I think he should based on his body of work. Um, but he this, my favorite term of the moment is concrescence. This idea that things are coming into to a whole, the, the complexity of everything is increasing and we can see it everywhere. I mean, you could talk about computer systems. I was watching a movie uh, last night that had something from the OJ Simpson trial and they were all using those Apple desktops and, you know, the big mobile phones. This was 15 years ago, you know? Um, so, you know, things are definitely speeding up. But what McKenna says is that it's just that more is happening in the time that we do have, which makes a lot of sense. And, it, and, it, and it, he also kind of flips the script of, you know, uh, we're, we're kind of pushing towards humanity. And he, he turns it around and says we're being pulled. Um, so I'm going to let him say it uh, as, you know, he does better than anyone. But this, this concept is, uh, I think, really relevant to trying to change the mind style of, of, of what it is that we see and how nature works. Um, let's check this one out. This was his last interview, uh, actually. And uh, let's see if they have the date. On is being dissolved. We're all broke. Let's rub a bank robber. Neither are you or you. Check this out. Before we go farther, I'd like you to attempt to give me a definition of concrescence and eschaton. Well, let's go backward. Eschaton first. Eschaton is a good word out of theology. It simply means the last thing. The last thing is the eschaton, and it is everything become one thing. 
uh, for theologians, it's God. For somebody of a more materialist bent, it might be something else. But the eschaton is the last thing. Eschatology is the study of the time of the last thing. Now, what was the other word? Concrescence. Concrescence. This is a little trickier concept. Uh, I took it from Alfred North Whitehead. Concrescence is the idea of something that grows together. It concresses. It becomes more dense, more connected, more defined in space and time. And when I talk about the transcendental object at the end of time, or the coming of the eschaton, or hyper-novelty, I mean that the process of the human and, and biological concrescence of intent reaches some kind of maximum. Concrescence is the end of the process of becoming. Becoming is not true being. True being exists at the concrescence. Be, uh, the kind of being we experience, becoming, is a partial state of being, much like history is a partial, partial state of concrescence. History definitely places us outside the world of biological intent, uh, the animal mind, but history does not bring us into the presence of the eschaton. It's a partial process, and concrescence is what waits at the end. The eschaton is the concrescence. But we really can't have any way of knowing what that that experience of that is going to be like. No. And the reason why is because asking that question is like asking a man looking east at 2 a.m. to describe the coming sunrise. It He can't because it is literally over the event horizon of the future. And when we look into the future... We see that the east is streaked with rosy dawn, but we cannot conceive of the day that is about to come. All we can see is the dim glow of some kind of eschatological promise. Ask me this question in 2010, and I'll have a different answer. So that's that's a trip, right? Um... So hopefully you you kind of are picking up what I'm putting down there. It's it's a uh, you know this ability to really change the way we look at things. I don't I don't think we really understand how influenced we are towards the story we're told of of, of what life is. And when when I saw that passage from McKenna, it was just it was like wow, you know that that's a fresh way of evaluating these things. And when you when you integrate that with plant progression or human progression or technological pro progression, it really, for me, draws a lot of insight towards uh, what it is that we're working with. Um, so you can kind of see that again, just to refresh, you know, you've got the algae, you've got the progression into to mosses. Um, imagine this not as plants pushing forward, but being pulled into a greater concrescence, into a greater uh, complexity. Uh, he uses the word novelty. I, I think that's an interesting way of putting that. Uh, into these the seedless vascular plants, into the gymnosperms, and then the angiosperms. And at this point, angiosperms represent about 80% of the plants that um, that we see, uh, that we're, we're aware of. Um, so within angiosperms, which is kind of where the focus will reside, um, which, you know, obviously they make the most sense as food crops, um, you have it's called monocots and dicots. Uh, John Ray was the first one to use this classification in 1682. Um, and, you know, what, what you're really looking at is a, whether the plant has a cotyledon. There's some other differentiators that we'll talk about. Um, but you, you have this, this kind of knee jerk to um, have in the dicot to have this, these, um, the first set of leaves, the cotyledon, is not photosynthetic. It's kind of a knee jerk. Here we go. The second set of leaves is the first true set of leaves. So you have, you know, monocots, they have uh, one cotyledon, a dicot has two, 
Um, you know, monocots have veins in their leaves. The leaves of dicots are net-like. Um, the flowering parts are multiples of three, fours or fives for dicots, kind of interesting. And then the way in which their vascular uh, bundles are organized, the xylem and the phloem is either, um, you know, throughout the vascular tissue um, of the plant or in a ring in, in the dicots. Um, so an another way to look at this is whether they have a taproot or not. Uh, a monocot generally does not have a taproot. It's got a fibrous root system, thick grasses, um, and dicot plants have generally have a taproot. Um, so, for example, one of the ways, if, if you're familiar with selective herbicides, uh, these artificial uh, herbicides that, ki that kill uh, weeds and not grass, for example, the way that works is they're leveraging the difference between a monocot and a dicot plant. Uh, the herbicide kills the dicot and it doesn't harm the monocot. Uh, science um, to its extreme there um, doesn't mean that it, it's helping the uh monocot plants it just means it won't kill them it's kind of like genetically modifying a crop and be able to spray pesticides on it or fungicides or whatever it may be and you know imagine it's not harming that plant uh, even if it's not directly it's harming the ecosystem that's there to help the plant uh, it's a bit of an aside uh, but this is a, a way in which you're differentiating uh, these different types of plants within the angiosperm category um, so let's talk about how plants grow um, animals you may have heard the term stem cells. Um, they have a determinate growth. You may have heard that term uh, talking tomatoes. You know, there's some tomato species that are determinate, meaning they grow to a bush and they stop. Same with beans, uh, bush beans, for example, versus pole beans or uh, indeterminate tomatoes that would grow as long as you let them, essentially. Um, so plants, you know, again, this is never a black and white scenario. There's always an outlier, but plants generally are indeterminate growth. Um, in plants and they grow instead of stem cells well, they're called mary stems that's greek for the for divide um and they're located all over the plant um so we're, we're you can see in um you have apical mary stems which are, are generally the primary root growth tip of the plant and then you have uh and then they're also found at the at the node kind of like the sucker on a tomato plant that's an apical mary stem um or basil or any kind of plant that you, if you top it, it grows from the node. Um, so that that's the apical Mary stem. The lateral Mary stems are, node, are, are uh, contained inside the plant and help the plant grow um, from within, thicker, if you will, rather than longer. Um, and then you have the same sort of apical Mary stem growth found in the root tip as well. Um, so these lateral Mary stems first are, you know, again, located um, inside the plant. They are, um, Supportive of the xylem and the phloem, which are the conductive parts of the plant that move nutrition and uh, moisture and things around within the plant. They're, they're part of the plant circulatory system. Uh, again, they increase the, the girth or the thickness of the plant. It's kind of like the annual rings you see on a tree. You know, you've seen these kinds of things, just kind of connecting some dots. Um, so again, you know, that's, that's coming from the inside here. There's also another one that, that, that grow from the inside, taller, inter, intercalic, intercalary. Mary stem. I have to say that slowly. Um, and so, you know, the apical Mary stem is, is, this is a really cool image right here um, under the microscope. And you can see, you know, now you know exactly what that growth tip's called. Um, and so th there's, there's a really interesting interplay of hormones in the apical Mary stem. If you've ever topped a plant, like, a, like I mentioned, a basil plant, and it grows bushier, um, over time, it'll grow into a little tree. It's almost barked. What you're doing is, is there's a, a hormone in the apical Mary stem called auxin. And when you remove that growth tip, the auxin keeps another hormone called gibberellin that encourages lateral growth um, dormant. And when you remove the auxin from the top, the gibberellin is allowed to express itself and the plant can grow uh, bushier and from its sides rather than from that growth tip, which makes a lot of sense. I mean, if you're a plant in the forest and the deer eats your head off, um, means you don't have to die. Uh, it's just a, a way plants have evolved an ability to, to uh, proliferate in their environment given stress. Um, so it's, it's really cool to see these kinds of things, you know, with the root and, and the root cap and how the plant differentiates itself and organizes itself. Um, fascinating stuff. So you have levels of organization in plants. Um, you have the organism itself. You have the plant organs. Um, then you have the tissues of the plant, and then you have the cells of the plant. Um, 
the, the organism is, is, is fairly familiar, you know, the shoot system and the root system, the shoot system being the stem, the leaf and the flower uh, above ground uh, where photosynthesis occurs, elevates the plant, the root system being underground, more of an anchor, uh, it's food storage and, and you know, uh, drinks water for the plant and absorbs nutrients. That's the leaf tissues can too. Um, and you, you have uh, plant organs. So, you know, again, fairly familiar root, stem, leaf, flower, um, you can see some of the vernacular here, you know, that apical Mary stem, uh, the, the petiole of a plant is the stem out to the leaf, the node where the main growth tip and the leaf branch uh, happen. That's where suckers on tomato plants grow from. Incidentally, you can clone a tomato plant. You can pinch that sucker off, put it in the ground, it'll grow a new plant. If you did that for a leaf, uh, I've done this before, I've cloned a, a leaf, and it will grow roots, but it doesn't have a brain in a sense. It doesn't have an ability to reproduce. So that's one way of differentiating it, an apical Mary stem from uh, a leaf, for example. Um, so again, most people are fairly familiar with this organization. I, I, again, drawing parallels, I think it's kind of interesting when you look at the elements of life and fire, air, water, and earth, you know, how they reconcile to different uh, postures of the plant. You know, we'll get into a lot more of this kind of uh, a philosophical view and uh, its relevance towards agronomy and the, and the energetic capacity of, of bioenergetics in the future. Um, but moving in, into the tissues of the planet, you have dermal tissue, vascular tissue, and ground tissue. Um, the dermal tissue is, is what's on the outside. It covers and protects the plant. The vascular tissue is the xylem and the phloem. It moves everything around inside the plant, kind of the, the circulatory system of the plant. And then the ground tissue is Kind of everything else. It's it's a storage system. It's a site that, that contains the chloroplast and photosynthesis, um, and it's a supporting mechanism for that vascular tissue. Uh, think about it like the fat of uh, a human uh, or an animal, for that matter. Um, and so you can see kind of an orientation of this. You have the, these three tissue types in all parts of the plant, and they work together to allow the plant organism to sustain itself. Um, and you, it's really interesting to look at the root. Uh, again, aren't those images fascinating to see kind of the differentiation of, of plants um, in a microscopic view? But you have this uh, zone of cell division. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, the, the root Mary stem is, is pushing through the soil. And then this, the, the cells that are generated then get assigned to different responsibilities. Uh, and then you have the zone of elongation and then that zone of differentiation. Uh, so the cells are dividing. They're being elongated and then they're differentiated into their roles. Um, and this is happening in, in, in all of the, the meristematic growth of plants or the primary growth tips of plants. Just an, another image of some of the more particular components of the tissues of plants. Uh, you can really see the zone of cell division, elongation and maturation or differentiation, if you will. Um, and then you know what that looks like in a literal context. Uh, you can see the xylem and the phloem, and that's, you know, where the things move up and down in the plant, uh, nutrition and moisture. It's really cool images there. Same with, the uh, you know, the stem anatomy. You have, uh, you know, uh, woody stems and then the dicot and the monocot. We looked at this, you know, how the dicot has the ring and the xylem and phloem are organized, um, whereas the monocots don't. Um, so a lot of complexity within the same categories of plants. I mean, you can really kind of get a sense of, of how uh, amazing plants are and the differentiation of, of, of the plant itself in regards to, to how it grows. Um, so, you know, again, you know, what can you draw on this to improve your agronomy? Um, well, knowing how the root systems work, knowing the life cycles of plants, um, knowing how they reproduce. Again, most of our, our agricultural uh, endeavors, as far as food goes, is is with the angiosperms and you know those those annual type plants that you know we can grow that may grow perennially. I mean, I had a woman in Progressive Gardens used to do uh, uh, to make cherry tomato plant, and she was an elderly lady. She was a real piece of work, but she had had the same cherry tomato plant for I think it was eight years. This was maybe ten years ago. Um, but I actually went over to her house and she would just, you know, pull the cherry tomato plant in her garage and it would lose its leaves and die back. Not unlike if you got citrus in the wrong kind of climate and then she would bring it out again. Um, and, you know, you would have that uh, regrowth, you know, every season. So, it, you know, typically a lot of the plants we grow as annuals 
we reach the time of the climate not being able to support their growth. And we assume that we call them annual plants, but they can actually live uh, a lot longer from an indeterminate standpoint. Um, similar kind of story, but, um, you know, I, I went to a, uh, I've been to many different hydroponic applications. And if you've ever seen a hydroponic greenhouse, it's, it's a fascinating endeavor. Um, but they have the plants on these strings that they run kind of like back and forth through the greenhouse. And as the plant grows up with its ap apical merry stem and they're harvesting the plant down here, they just lay the plant down and they, they got it up on a trellis, uh, up on these strings, and they just move it down kind of like a shower curtain. And they'll just lay the plant down over time. And that plant may be 100, 200 feet long uh, when they cycle it through. And because they're able to control their environments, they're, they're able to, to grow the plant for as long as it is, is productive. Um, question I've always wanted to ask them that I will next time I'm in one is, you know, how long, what's the longest they've had one going? Well, I mean, that woman had it for seven years, but, you know, three years in, does it begin to lose virility? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but it's definitely true that plants will live a lot longer than we give them credit in that capacity. So they just harvest the plant, lay it down, and you can see in the rock wool or whatever growing media that they're using, you know, just strings of plants running back and forth through this greenhouse. Uh, it's really, really fascinating. Um, so, you know, looking at the leaf anatomy, you know, it's it's even more complex than the stem anatomy. Uh, it's got a lot more going on. I mean, you're, you know, photosynthesizing You've got parenchyma cells. These are typically um, like the fat of an animal. Um, you know, this dermal tissue. Uh, you can see the xylem and the phloem. This would be a dicot, um, how it's organized in that ring. Uh, the guard cells that let CO2 in and out. Um, so, you know, plants are really, um, really particular beings. And same with the flower. You know, you may be familiar with some of this as well. Um, but you have the male reproductive parts as, as the stamen um, and the females, the, the carpal, uh, the stigma, the style and the ovary here. Um, so you, you have the, uh, you know, the pollen coming into the stigma uh, that fertilizes the egg. Uh, the seed is then produced, plant proliferates that either through the wind or through physicality or through the carrier of uh, organisms. There's a lot of plants that rely on um, animals eating them so that they can kind of scar and condition the seeds um and it's, it's it, you know, scarification is the term of where you have a seed and you, you know if you try to germinate it it won't germinate um with just moisture um you know typically we you know people are putting light on the plants that they're starting well st plants generally start through moisture and, and temperature so when you've got the moisture able to infiltrate the seed it kind of activates these biochemical processes that create turgor pressure and the radical or that first root tip comes out, cracks the seed like an egg, the radical orients itself down and, you know, the plant comes up. And if you grow in plants, you still see the seed on the cotyledon, those first two leaves. And you may remember from germinating seeds, that cotyledon looking different than the second set of leaves, as I was mentioning earlier, that first set of leaves is not photosynthetic. Um, so in concept, you can start plants in the dark as long as the temperature and the moisture are, are right and get really good germination. Um, etiolation is the term given to actually restricting light to plants. Uh, a lot of people that grow microgreens do that. And the, I think the main reason to do it, um, other than maybe saving a little electricity from a commercial level, is to get even germination rates. If you get a plant that, seed that germinates and it's got light, and it's able to get ahead of the other ones, well, then you've got a taller plant and one that's just getting started. So if you etiolate the, the plants, you get an even germination. You're not encouraging some and others, and they can all kind of get to the right height. And then when you put the light on them, it's really cool to do. They, they're white. And then you put the light on them, when within a couple of minutes, you start to see the green pigment begin to, to metabolize. And uh, they, they know exactly what to do, and they, and they get rolling. Um, so, you know, that idea of, of understanding the, the seed scarification and, you know, how to soak seeds if you need to, you know, uh, sunflower seed, if you're growing sprouts uh, or starting them, don't really like to be soaked. But, you know, wheat berries for wheatgrass do. Uh, I'll do a, a whole show on wheatgrass at some point. I grew that commercially for about 10 years and um, also uh, microgreens, which is a, a very uh you know, short cycle crop, good, really good local business. Um, so we'll do a, a show on that as well. Um, 
and you know, a lot of they've spoiled a lot. So you, you can get a lot of local clients. I mean, the way I started my wheatgrass business, just taking them flat of the wheatgrass I was growing at home, you know, and they called me within an hour, like we're doing this stuff. Their regulars loved it. And, you know, we did 600, six, $800 a week in one health food store uh, selling flats of wheatgrass. So uh, yeah, stay tuned for, for information on that as we go. Um, and so, you know, a little bit of a side there, but the idea of, of, of seeds and, you know, how they work is, is relevant towards understanding the, the, the um, orientation of the plants that you're growing. Um, and so then you get down to the cells, you know, and you have a bunch of really wild words, right? Um, you know, you have like the cytoplasm, that's the, 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 the um, liquid point portion of the cell you have the the central vacuole is kind of like a a pressure regulator you know it's able to 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 uh, increase its volume or decrease it based on the the detergent pressure that the cell needs based on the environment that it's in um you know the cell speaking to its outer surroundings is an extremely complex um process and um you know there's Give you an example, you know, the reason sodium chloride is so bad for you is not because it's a poison. Um, I might argue with that, by the way, but it's sodium and chlorine are vital for health, right? But they're singular elements. So they're not in any kind of balance compared to sea salt, for example. Incidentally, sea minerals are balanced like human blood is. So when you use sea salts or use uh, natural forms of salts, you're reinforcing the balance of the body as opposed to creating that haywire, you know, that, that sodium chloride on its own can create on unbelievable amounts of balance. And you may know people or have had this experience yourself where, you know, you get bloated or you have water weight or you know, hypertension, high blood pressure, these kinds of things. And the doctor's going to put you on a low sodium diet. Um, that's really born of how we process foods in the modern world. You know, you have uh, a lot of sodium chloride used it's cheaper, um, it was sold to us by having iodine added to it and it cured goiter, ba- goiter back in the forties. And it was a really good step forward, but it stayed with us. And, and we took this salt into the future and it's really created havoc. But the point being when you're eating sodium and chlorine only out of that balance, your cells have to lose lots of moisture to balance and dilute the imbalance that you're creating. Uh, and that's the water weight. That's the bloatedness. Um, and, it, and it can also be a reversal of that where the cells are taking on more water. Um, so, you know, it's, it's an interesting aside to think about that in regards to plant growth, right? It's, it's really one of the misnomers in conventional agriculture where you're using, you know, three to five elemental products uh, to grow plants, you know, NPK, maybe some calcium. Um, you know, a lot of people don't get beyond that. Um, so you can imagine the imbalance that we're creating in the soil. Why would mother nature make an element not needed in the soil? You know, she wouldn't. And this is one of the justifications of sea mineral fertilizers and trace element agriculture, which is I'm, I'm a huge proponent of, um, simply from the fact that, you know, we don't know what we're missing if we're not adding it. Um, and, and the plant isn't able to operate at that peak efficiency as I, I started this talk with, you know, it's, we're really restricting the plant's ability to, to make its own, uh, amazing if, if you will um but you know you look a lot around and, and you see the you know the uh mitochondria which is kind of the nerve center uh of the cell and is, is kind of producing um all of the metabolites and the complexities of what plants can make out of the glucose after it's finished in the photosynthetic process uh, we'll get into some some discussion of that next week in regards to photosynthesis and respiration and the building up process of photosynthesis and the breaking down process of respiration. Um, and you know, the, the ribosomes and, and the nucleus here. Um, so the intelligence of one cell is, is off the charts. It, it really is, uh, a really fascinating, um, thing to dive into, to, the, to plants here. So I wanted to kind of get a, give a, a good, primer um on kind of give you a little tour of a plant cell uh, let's check this out both animals and plants are made up of cells their cells have many features in common but there are a few significant differences let's look inside a leaf to take a closer look at a plant cell First, we encounter a protective cell wall outside the plasma membrane. The cell wall is made from strong cellulose fibrils. 
Once inside the plant cell, we see the large central vacuole, which regulates the composition of the cytoplasm, creates the internal pressure that is characteristic of plant cells, and stores various compounds produced by the cell. Plants make their own food by photosynthesis in chloroplasts. Light passes through the two membranes of the chloroplast and strikes these green disks where light energy is converted to chemical energy. The sugar molecules produced by photosynthesis can be made into other molecules or broken down for energy. All plant cells have mitochondria, just like animal cells do. Sugars produced by photosynthesis are broken down and converted to ATP in mitochondria. Most organelles, like mitochondria, are found in both plant cells and animal cells. So the next time you pass by a plant, remember that we have more in common than meets the eye. So yeah, you got um, you know plants are are uh, endlessly fascinating. We're all here for one reason or another, but we all have a relationship to plants. Um, so you know, a little bit of a, a textbook approach to things. Uh, I find it is really helpful, and some of the things we'll get into in the future to have this documented and have a conversation about it. Um, you know, but it's a uh, little bit, it's funny going, going through a lot of this reminds me of, of a lot of the school that, that I had. And uh, I remember plant physiology it was 205 and it was one of my favorite classes because we, we really got into the guts of the plant, you know, and we really, um, you know, learned what the Golgi apparatus was and, and, and had all of this intellectual knowledge, but we, we really never talked about, you know, what the plant was um, and, and how it all worked together. We, we learned the, the literalness of the process, but we didn't really get into the, the spirit of the organism. And, you know, I, I, I want to bring that out. You know, I kind of did with the McKenna piece because, you know, the, there's a philosophy to everything. And the idea that, you know, science and spirit is separate is, has created a lot of, uh, of difficulty and our ability to um, be better farmers first um but but speak the same language you know and and not compartmentalize ourselves in in such a way that that becomes so restrictive to the conversation that we really need to be having in my view um you know, that's one of the greatest lessons that i was given in school was this crash course on how to rip everything apart give it a name um and you can see the the, the approach that we take on that we just look at medicine right a, a lot of it is active ingredient driven um you know, it's, it's a lot like, uh, you know, when you find a good active ingredient, you know, take something like vitamin C. It's not that vitamin C on its own uh, is negative in any way. It can be very therapeutic. Uh, vitamin C chemically is what we call ascorbic acid, um, which is actually a manufactured molecule. We know what it looks like chemically. We can uh, create it in a lab and we can add it to juices and pretend it's the vitamin C that an orange produced. Um, I put that in the show notes last week, that book squeezed, it came up again. I, I didn't really plan on that, but it's, it's, it's really kind of interesting to understand what it is that we're telling ourselves is what, uh, you know, relative to what we think it is, relative to what it actually is. Um, and, and this exercise of kind of the magic of, of the synergy of the organism and really looking at it from that organism standpoint and then using that mind style to, to, to push that out into the greater ecosystem and look at the farm as an organism, right? And the farm has got a Golgi apparatus in some way. And one of the things that we'll get into in the spiritual uh, context and the energetic component of, of um, which is not all spiritual. I mean, all life is energy. Thinking is synapses and, um, you, you know, uh, in some respects, you know, uh, the exchange capacity in the soil right? is opposites attract. So energy sounds woo-woo kind of approach, but the reality of it is that life is energy organized and in resonance. Um, so, you know, but it, it also kind of like the, the physical has the physical character, such of the soil and the plant, you know, we kind of have to categorize. It's, in, it's kind of chasing cats, kind of like trying to define life from a plant perspective or from a life perspective. You know, there's always these outliers, but the, the, the method of how we 
integrate all of these things and evaluate and view it can really change the way we grow. It has for me. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's a struggle to put it into words. A lot of it is a, is a feeling, is a nuance, is an, is an understanding. Um, but I, I can say very definitively that the effort that I've put into really trying to challenge myself to look at the world from a, a, a spiritual, integrated, resonant organism has paid off in, in so many different ways, I, I can't tell you. And, and my goal here is to try to influence y'all out there in, in some small way towards having that same sort of experience. Um, so, you know, we, we've encapsulated all, all of this into um, a, a methods we call fertility management services that do soil testing, water testing, uh, and really follow up with some soil testing and really take an analytical approach to the farm organism. Um, and it, we've got modules for lawn care, for uh, container gardens, for indoor controlled environment grows, farms with and without irrigation, uh, turf growers, all sorts of people. Um, but the idea is it's not that the, the analytics is, is restrictive. It, it is when we end all be all, but the idea is that the data is the bridge right? It's like if you get a soil test, if you're having all kinds of issues on your farm and you get a soil test and you, you see it in the data, um, you know, that you've got a third or a fourth of the potassium you need in, in your soil, all of a sudden you've got that immediate connection, you know? And then what you can do with that data is go out there and start performing field sprays, for example, that are like homeopathic applications. And you can change the frequencies of what you're spraying to the field based on what you expose the, the source matter to uh, in your compost or whatever method you are of uh, potentizing material. And when you apply these vibrations into imploded water and spray them out to the field, it can measurably change the environment, whereas you didn't really even physically deliver anything. And to see data change through known influence, I mean, it'll blow your mind. You know, it, it changes the whole game of, of how we've taught ourselves to think about these things. Again, that's, that's part of this exercise. So, you know, I mean, plants are hard to define. I'd, I'd say more like impossible. Um, and they're fundamental. You know, there's there's not too much more to say about, um, you know, when you're talking plant taxonomy and anatomy, this is really a very literal place. Um, and to say there's not more to understand about, you know, plants and, and how they work uh, is, is not true. I mean, we're, we're always coming to new terms. I mean, take the Venus flytrap, you know, I don't know if you're aware of Venus flytraps, but I mean, most people are, but in terms of their history, but they occur within a 75 mile radius around me in Wilmington, North Carolina. It's the only place in the world that they're endemic to, or that they're from. They've been introduced in other places. But when I first heard that, I didn't believe it because, you know, feed me Seymour, you'd think the Amazon produced some kind of carnivorous plant. And in some respects, they have pitcher plants. There's some in other areas. Um, but the Venus flytrap is only from this area. And it's, it's kind of interesting, you know, if you follow the thread, the Nature Conservatory spent some uh, research um, effort into trying to reverse engineer it. And there's things called Carolina Bays around me that basically there's just little pockets of, of uh, dimples and in, in that have become little lakes in the woods around us. You can see it aerially. It's pretty amazing. And uh, there was an asteroid that hit here mil millions of years ago. And the, the proposition was that it changed the localized environment in some way. I don't mean you can think UFO or alien if you want, but um, that produced this organism. So, you know, that's just one example of how complex plants can get. And, uh, you know, the abilities of plants. We sit here and talk about how they're autotrophs. Well, um, you know, a Venus flytrap doesn't want to be fertilized. It grows in bog, peat bogs, you know, where there's very low fertility, very high moisture. And they need the, the enzyme, the, the enzymes they use to break down that fly juice and you know create the mush that they ingest uh, to sustain themselves. So they're a heterotroph, right? Um, so that you know, there's always always outliers, but um, you know, hopefully you got something out of this uh, little primer of kind of where plants come from. Um, you know, what we'll talk about uh, next time is, is is the physiology of the plants and the processes they undertake, photosynthesis for respiration. Uh, we'll get a real good feel of of how all that works. Um, and then we'll look into move into like how plants eat, you know, what they eat. We'll talk fertilizers, forms, um, you know, get into a session on soil testing from a base saturation standpoint, and it'll give you a real clear understanding of kind of the misnomers of conventional soil testing from an extension service. It's not the data that the data they generate is wrong. It's just incomplete. 
Uh, they're looking at it from a very pH driven perspective, whereas when you get the balance right, the pH is always where you want it to be. It's the afterthought. pH should never drive your action in terms of your agronomy. So I'll give you some some case studies of kind of you know how we've uh, done that through data. Uh, and then, you know, we'll talk about hydroponics at some point, and, and that's all in the, the, the mineral capacity of bioenergetics. And then, of course, after that, we'll get into the biological uh, and the energetic. So, uh, as always, you know, really appreciate being here. And if there's any questions at all, I'm happy to engage them.